This episode contains mature language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. You wake, standing on the doorstep of a beautiful mansion. The front door stands open. You can hear voices, music, so many, many people. You step towards the door. You have to know what's inside. You are lost. You have no memory of how you got here. It doesn't matter. Because now, you belong to... The Grey Rooms. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 15. I can't believe we've reached just beyond the midway point of our third season. It's been a wild ride so far, and we love having all of you with us. It's been really nice to see a lot of new listeners joining us online and on Discord for Beckett's Journey. Welcome to the manor. We have plenty of horrors in store. But, if you're brand, brand new to the rooms... Do make sure you jump back to the beginning of the season so you don't miss a single adventure. Many secrets are to be revealed tonight, and we don't want you to miss a thing. Join us, won't you? (laughs) Oh, and uh, listeners, after you listen to this episode, make sure to check out the Grey Room social media channels. We've got a surprise treat for you this week from a special friend of the rooms award-winning artist and podcast aficionado, Mitch Jarrods. A little bonus art for this week's episode, Tear Me Down. Also, if you get a chance, make sure to pick up a copy of the latest issue of Strange Adventures from DC Comics and see more of Mitch's amazing artwork. Now, on to the episode. Dad, he's at the door. Good. This has been a long time coming. Stay close, son. I'm not going anywhere. Good evening, Admiral. Bob. I see you've made yourself at home. I have. You came straight to the study the moment you returned, I assume. You assume correctly. Hmm. Is it worth asking how you got past the locks and wards on the door? You've kept so many secrets from me. This one is mine. Hmm. I've made good use of my time. There's a great deal of interesting reading here in your journals and your tapes. <clears throat> well then, if we're going to have this conversation, I need a drink.
You don't seem particularly surprised to see me. Should I be? I know what an explorer you are. I've been hiding your wanderings from management since almost the beginning. Hmm. I thought as much. Why? Admiral, I'll make you a deal. For as long as this conversation lasts, I'll be completely honest with you. All of my... what's the expression? Cards are on the table. In return, I'd like you to be honest with me. Deal. All right then. To answer your question, I hid your explorations to avoid even the possibility that management would deem you unfit for the program. I had every reason to believe the loss of another subject would be blamed on me. Like Samantha Winters. The loss of Miss Winters was a crushing blow to the project. She was by far our most successful guest to date. There were a number of extenuating circumstances, but... The Architect is well known for having high standards. I couldn't afford to have your eccentricities draw too much attention. It's interesting you describe me as eccentric, Bob. That is a word I would have reserved for Miss Winters. Even I find it all a bit distasteful. Do you blame a cat when it plays with a mouse? I could, so I did it. I was a god. Well, you're no god here, are you? Yes. And it's a bit of a bitch, Bob. Fascinating. So you don't regret it? Any of it? I only regret it's over. Happiest time of my life. All of our guests have... Troubled pasts, yourself included, Admiral. But you knew that, didn't you? Once you realized where your memories were leading, you asked Alma to shield you from the truth. Have you listened to your own interview tapes? I have. It was not terribly pleasant. Do I hear a tremor in your voice? A shame. You were made of sterner stuff back then. Oh, don't think my will is failing me now, Bob. I've succeeded where so many others have failed. I know everything. A toast to your success then, Admiral. Tell me. You have your answers. What are the Grey Rooms? To start with, I'm in hell. What gave it away? Conversations with Todd, actually. You people think too little of him. For whatever it's worth, I don't think he's a joke. I think he's a menace. But that's an issue for another day. Hmm. He helped me to understand the motivations behind your actions. To understand why you'd go out of your way to make the Grey Rooms inviting. To make your guests comfortable. Beautiful tapestries. Comfortable chairs. And high tea with my attendants. It's hardly the image of hell we mortals are sold. You don't want us in constant pain. You want... something else. In the hearth porch, you told me that the older iterations of the rooms were less successful. That it wasn't until Raymond that you started to see results. What results? What is the project for? What's the key here, the fulcrum upon which all of this turns? Uh. 
Am I boring you? Not at all. I've learned during my time with you mortals how fortifying some ether in the system can be. And this conversation will require two, at least. Pour you something? No, thank you. Anyway, Todd's musings were quite helpful in focusing my search after I'd gotten into the study. You have some fascinating tomes in here. I'm glad they saw some use. Most of them just gather dust these days. So, what is the key? Why do we make the guests feel comfortable? I used to tell my children we are the choices we make. It was my way of making them think before they acted. To make them understand that their choices mattered. That they mattered. But here in the rooms, our choices mark us. Different from you. I learned in your tomes that we, mere mortals, can do something that you demons can't. We can choose. We have free will. To be evil. To be good. To make the world better or tear it down. Then that's not something you have. Is it? Is it, Bob? No. It is not. You're called the Chained Ones by other creatures, I believe. You're all in service to some greater power. Your lives are not your own from the moment your existence begins. Or did I misunderstand? You understand correctly. Me, my people, we can't be anything other than what we are, how we were born. All of those beings in your books, they're all like that, aren't they? The winged servants of the mount, the ancient forest dwellers, the tentacled horrors of the far. Mortals, it seems, are the only ones who can truly chart their own course. That's the key. Isn't it, Bob? Free will. The ability to choose. That's why you take us for the Grey Rooms. <sighs> yes. And those you take... David, Samantha, Todd, Raymond... What do we all have in common? Why us? What do you have in common? Oh, allow me. Raymond, our first guest. He was a pathetic, weak idiot. He killed his family and died in an electric chair with hatred and violence in his heart. Todd Mathis, a womanizer and sociopath, grew to hate the ruling class that governed his world and became the figurehead of a thriving terrorist network. Died in his final act of sabotage, setting off a chain reaction that ended human habitation on his planet. Samantha Winters, an art student, swept up in the furor of a cult. She was touched by an eldritch power pretending to be a penitent god, and died after a centuries-long rule as Earth's cruel and unforgiving deity. And then, of course, Admiral David Beckett. A petty war criminal who became admiral via a self-appointed title. The flourish of a narcissistic power-hungry dictator. You died, mourned by no one. A legendarily despotic emperor who held the twelve galaxies in his fist. You were all psychopaths and sinners. Destined for hell. Destined to burn. But not... <clears throat> but not here. Isn't that right? No. Not here. We were waylaid. Taken for the project. Yes. So then... We're here to choose. 
stolen from our proper torment to open your doors and die your deaths again and again. Insane. Maddening. The more I read, the more I understood. But... But why? To what end? What's the goal? What's to gain? I knew you'd be here soon, that you'd find me. I stood just there, Bob, staring at your stacks of journals. And I knew I had to take a chance. A risk. So I threw them all to the ground, looking for your first tome. Your first notes. I thought perhaps by going back to the beginning I might finally understand. And there it was. One of your original entries. One of the very first things you wrote down after joining the project. We are cosmic fishing lures cast out into the darkness. Our choices propel us between worlds. To the locus as Alma and the architect arrange. And there, every single man, woman, and child we encounter is what? Hooked. Snared by this infernal lobster pot you've created. The soldiers in that war trench. The mercenaries at Ice Station Bravo. That serial killer artist and all his victims. The passengers on the Greyfriars train. Nolan and his family. The crew of the Aurora Borealis. Even the little girl and her teddy bear. They're all here. Aren't they, Bob? Souls harvested by the power of the rooms and targeted by the choices we guests make. Behind all the mysteries, behind all the magic, the Grey Rooms are nothing more than a cosmic scam. A way to wring blood from a stone. Souls are your currency. And you've been using me to pickpocket the universe. But I'm just a narcissistic, power-hungry mortal. Perhaps I've gotten it wrong. Bravo, Admiral. I truly do believe you are the first mortal to fully understand the project. We've taken pains to ensure even Todd doesn't comprehend the whole picture. So, well done. Thank you. Yes, well, I'm going to finish my drink. And then, with my apologies, I'm going to have to tear you limb from limb. What? Why? No mortal man is supposed to understand the project, Admiral. And the knowledge you've gained here today could very well impact our... What did you call it? Soul harvest. So... A few moments of agony and it will be all over. With luck, the Architect will be able to put you back together with some of your early memories on the project intact. It would be a shame to have to start over again. But, in the balance... In the balance, the life of one pitiful mortal is insignificant. Meaningless. Compared to the power we can wield. Thanks to the Grey Rooms. Unfortunately for you, Bob, I am not like other men. Sis, Rapin, Ardenaila! Sorry, attendant, but you won't be tearing anyone apart today. Nice work, Dad. I rather think so, too. Don't worry, Bob. This little trick should wear off in a couple of hours. More than enough time for me to get to my door. 
I've never looked forward to escaping into a locus before. Strange how times change, I suppose. Oh, uh, one more thing, I think. Well, um... I think it's past time I met the Architect. Don't you agree? Please, ask her if she'd be willing to sit with me after I return. I'm sure we'd have a great deal to talk about. Ask her politely, if you don't mind. Come, son. Death and the future awaits. Come on, Tom. I don't like this one. It's making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Oh, it's interesting. You can almost feel the ominous quiet. Tear me down, huh? It's so dark, though, don't you think? And what is that supposed to be in the water? It's up to you, Jen. It can be whatever you want it to be. Okay, come on. Dinner's at seven, remember? But the picture has me, and I'm not going anywhere just yet. As I take another step closer, I swear I can feel the breeze, and there is a faint but unmistakable smell of the ocean. Huh. I inspect the surroundings for some sort of sensory equipment, a vent, perhaps, that is creating the effect. My skin is beginning to contract, and random patches prickle with the sensation of night chills. With full attention back on the picture itself, I follow the jagged silver blade of moonlight as it cuts the uninviting black void of water into two, dwindling just after reaching the grey-looking shore. Emerging from the shallow water is a shape, a contorted arrangement of tentacles and disfigured limbs that somehow make sense. Bright yellow eyes are the only other source of color, and they capture my gaze. I feel an overwhelming pull towards them. Tom? I can hear voices skimming across the water now, a series of undulating whispers that cut in and out and get progressively louder towards the shore, but I, I can't make them out. I take another step forward and I'm now only a few feet away from the yellow orbs that sit at the center of this abstract demon. Jen's voice beckons me, but it sounds even further away now. Something special is happening here and besides i don't think i can leave it's it's as though this peace has chosen me the smell of seaweed is now much stronger and the light from the moon even brighter purer more whispers rush towards me but they are incomprehensible a strange and different language and certainly not one of this world my heart rate is increasing as the excitement builds, but there is also a niggling sense of dread that can't be ignored. It's impossible to pull away now. <laughs> I'm on this ride and strapped in. I can no longer hear the pretentious chatter or heels on the marble floor. No, only the gentle water lapping on the shore and the light breeze that projects from the peace. Never has art impacted Jen, me in this way. I'll be done All soon. my senses are alive. Even the saltiness of the water lingers at the back of my throat. I feel someone pulling at me. Jen, I guess. 
but the hypnotic yellow eyes won't let me go, and I move even closer towards them. The next set of whispers is carried in on the gentle waves, and the language no longer seems quite as alien to me. As I put my ear to the glass, the words are beginning to make sense. Another attempt at dragging me back that I shrug off. Shh, Jen, g g go and get a drink. I'll be done soon. As if it will help, I press the side of my head against the picture with further pressure, and I'm suddenly falling. Shoes sink into the damp sand as I stumble forward towards the foaming tide. Uh, what the fuck? I feel the breeze in all its glory now, awakening more patches of skin as it rushes across me. The large moon hangs in the air with undeniably majestic beauty, but its light casts a menacing shadow on the creature in the water. It is perhaps only a couple of hundred feet ahead. The yellow eyes are no longer visible. Urgently, I turn my head only to see Jen walking back towards the bar. Uh, Jen? I call out, but with no response. I feel disoriented. Even breathing no longer seems as automatic. A single loud click from behind startles me and I turn, holding my breath in terrorized anticipation. And then it moves. It's a single and clumsy lurch forward that sends my heart racing and the silver water rippling. I can just about make out the head that frames the now black as coal eyes. It's pebble smooth, flat and round, and almost translucently pale. In the center of its face is a small cavity that I assume to be a nose of sorts. Large gills to either side open and close redundantly, I guess from muscle memory. The larger-than-human mouth hangs open, but reveals no teeth. The first of the whispers are brought into shore by the gentle breaking tide. I try and take a step back, but something obstructs me. Turning quickly, I see Jen nearly at the bar with her finger in the air to get the barman's attention. Another couple passes in front of me, arms entwined, and wine glasses in their free hands. I scream as loud as I can, but nobody turns. I quickly look over my shoulder to see the creature emerging from the water, its jerky movements impossibly efficient, as the shortened limbs and large tentacles work in impossible unison, a combination of scuttling and dragging. A strange garbled noise leaves my lips as I reach out, trying to get back to Jen and the safe world, and my hands almost immediately come up against an invisible force field that feels like glass. I feel my way around it, trying to find the secret portal that brought me here, and the one that will take me back to the safety of the gallery, but nothing is happening. Panicking, I slam my fists against the glass. <laughs> Behind me, I can hear the creature continuing its approach across the sand. I can sense its anticipation, the clicking increasing in intensity. This is your new home. Christ, it's only a few feet away now. I make a run towards the trees in the distance, and with the help of the compacted sand, start putting some distance between us. The smell of seaweed has been replaced by something far more pungent that is laying heavy at the back of my throat and causing my stomach to churn. I'm sprinting as fast as I can now, heart pumping and blood pounding in my ears. Ah. The pain.
pain is excruciating. An explosion of blinding light and breaking bones. And I know my nose is broken. <clears throat> Slumping to the floor against the invisible barrier that I guess must be the edge of the artwork, I listen to the clicking as it gets louder and more intense. And then I feel the tentacle wrapping around my right ankle. I kick out and scream in protest and somehow manage to break free from its clutch, scrambling against the side of my new cage. Through the makeshift window that is the glass of the picture, I can see Jen talking to someone, holding two glasses of champagne. I scream again, but I know that she can't hear me. Another tentacle wraps around my left leg, and this time starts dragging me across the damp and gritty sand. Desperately, I dig my fingernails into the ground, but only succeed in carving out small canals as it effortlessly hauls me towards the blackness of the ocean. I turn towards it and see the tentacles and limbs working together in an ugly but mechanical harmony, sinewy muscles snapping and twisting underneath the pale green skin. Hysterical, I begin to throw myself around in desperation, thrashing wildly against the sand. I feel my left shoe come off, and suddenly my leg is free. I try and stand to make a run for it, but before I can even get to my feet, another tentacle wraps around my waist and continues to heave me towards the moonlight. The interminable clicking has become terrifyingly voluminous, but it's the black eyes that terrify me. There is no empathy or compassion to be found, just like the blackness of the ocean itself. The creature stops, then. So does the clicking. It looks down towards me, a living, breathing montage of body parts emerging from its twisted body, deformed limbs of children and adults that suggest horrors beyond belief. It brings its face close to mine, observing me with interest. I hear the gentle waves in the background and the accompanying whisper that washes in with them. Remember, you chose this beast. Cold and slimy tentacles begin to wrap around me. Their touch is at first repulsive, but then I give in to their softness and serenity flows through me. The creature draws me in towards its face. My heart rate adjusts so that it is pounding in time with the gills that open and close so rhythmically. Its black eyes no longer terrify me, but fill me with an inexplicable calm. The creature opens its mouth to expose the blackness within, vast and as endless as the ocean, and impossibly it keeps expanding. Suddenly, deformed hands are grasping from the dimness, and I can feel them reaching inside me, scraping my spine and clawing at my soul. Blackness begins to fill my vision. The tide is coming in. I am helpless. Momentarily, I consider that it was all just a dream. But as I open my eyes to the silver moonlight and the sound of water reaching the shore, I know it isn't so. I try to move, but clumsily fall to my back again, noting the pale tentacles that are spread limply across the sand. My arms and legs are not where they should be. Instead, my body is a mutated collection of human limbs. I try again, but my new arms and legs flail redundantly in the air like a bug that has been turned over. I attempt to scream, but only a clicking emerges. 
Focusing my efforts once more, I try with all my might to move and succeed in raising a tentacle and pushing myself onto my side. And I see the imposter that has stolen my body a hundred feet ahead on shore, walking back towards the egress to my old world, brushing the sand from my clothes. Suddenly I feel an urgency to get into the water. The gills on the side of my face instinctively open and close, but they're effectively useless out of the water. I try and take a deep breath through my new mouth, but it doesn't relieve the pressure. Slowly and clumsily, I drag myself towards the foaming water, but it's exhausting. My body feels so dry, and every movement is labored. I know I only have seconds before it will give up. It feels useless. The tiny legs that randomly emerge from this contorted mess of a body help a little, but the water still seems so far away. But then I manage to move one of the tentacles, albeit painfully slowly, and then another one. It's as though I'm learning to walk for the first time all over again. I begin to make good ground as the limbs and tentacles start to function simultaneously. Finally, relief washes over me as one of my tentacles reaches the water. Urgently, I drag myself in, submerging my head into the liquid silver, and almost immediately I can feel life beginning to ebb into my new body. There is also a, a faint sense of belonging. I turn around to see the imposter on the other side of the glass now. Behind them, in the distance, I can make out Jen. She's on her way back with the drinks. Suddenly, I feel so alone, as though I am home, but with no one to share it. But something is changing. My mind is beginning to fill with evil thoughts. I try to move, but the water around me is setting like concrete, and I can feel its blackness seeping into my skin and through my veins like poison. It's as though the ocean is possessing my soul. My thoughts continue to darken as the ocean nurtures me on all the dark secrets it has witnessed over the centuries. Well, now I can't move at all. I am trapped, a conscious statue forced to gaze into the window of his old world. I, I am the audience now, on the other side of the glass, looking in. The comforting sounds of the water are gone, as is the freshness of the breeze. In the distance, the echoey sounds of the gallery begin to filter through the clink of glasses, the background chatter, and then the sound of heels as they click abruptly against the luxurious marble floor. What the hell happened to you? And where's your shoe? If she looked closely, she would be able to see it, just on the edge of the sliver of moonlight. I watch them walk away. My partner for ten years and the unknown that has possessed my body. All I have now is time and the evil thoughts that plague my mind. <laughs> it suddenly becomes clear. The letters uh, tear me down. It's an anagram. Water. Demon.
Tear Me Down, written by Mark Taus, with performances by Peter Lewis as Tom, Krista Lewis as Jen, and Graham Rowett as Ocean. The Problem with Free Will, written by Michael Zenke, featuring performances by Michael Turrentine as Samuel, Eddie Cooper as Beckett, Graham Rowett as Bob, and Sarah Ruth Thomas as Samantha. Musical composition is by J.M. Scherf. Episode artwork, web development, and creative direction by Cassie Pertit. Social media and Patreon management by Brooks Bigley. Videography by Hale Scherf. Audio engineering and sound design is by me, Jason Wilson. Once again, listeners, we love having all of you and wish you the best of health in this trying time. We hope you enjoyed Tear Me Down by author Mark Taus. Put down your paintbrushes and join us next week as we delve even further into the utter despair of the Grey Rooms. Speaking of our patrons, we would also like to take the time to thank our patrons once again and to any of those who have taken the time to leave us a five-star rating and review. These reviews keep us at the top of the charts and makes it easier for Twisted Souls to find the show. And our wonderful patrons help make this possible and keep the lights on. Patrons like Aaron Anthony, Amy Nikolai, Arthur Unk, Di Varelli, Ellie Dowell, Emily Cullen, Jackalbot Snows, Ronan Kumori, Jason Porras, Jeremiah Overstreet, Jessica Finch, Karina Sonina, Kelly Bear, Kyle Wilcox, Laura Lupinetti, Lynn Browning, Lizzie B., Megan Pruitt, Michael Velez, Mike Devine, Michael Philick BG, Paige Pye, Patrick Stewart, Plin Plin Plon, all night long. Sean Gary, Sean McCorkwadale, Shay Barbie, Sparky Anglin, Spirit Live, Stacy Thewis, Talicia Gullman, The Original Nick Show, and Teresa Tabor. The Grey Rooms is also streaming for free on Spotify. Just get the Spotify app or open the browser and search The Grey Rooms. And we here at The Grey Rooms love our fans and want to give back to you in the best way we know how. We have a lot of fun things to show you and we hope you like it. And you can find out more just by joining us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, as well as Reddit and YouTube. And we took your advice and extended an olive branch to all the tortured souls who have passed through the rooms. Our emotional support group is always looking to help you with all of your your needs. And don't forget about our merch store. It's full of epic designs and logos for you to sport, showing the world you are a survivor of these very rooms. All of this can be found in the show notes or on our website at thegrayrooms.com. And if you would like to become a patron and financially support the show, then please go to patreon.com forward slash thegrayrooms today and find the tier that's right for you. Anything helps, and it means a ton. And let's not forget about our Discord channel. Jump on over there for all the fun conversation and activity that takes place daily. You can meet the authors, you can meet the actors, you can meet the cast and crew of the Grey Rooms itself, including Bob, Todd, and the Warden. Run. Run far. So join that today and celebrate in all the chaos with each of us. Episode 15 of Season 3. Two episodes past our normal conclusion point, and we're not done yet. We have a lot more to do to finalize this season for you and and really end it on a bang. So with that, we will get back to work to keep you on the edge of your seat. Thank you again for all of your support. We truly appreciate it. And until next time, we'll see you next week. <laughs>